Hi, everybody. Welcome to Lurking for Legends. Lurking for Legends is a live video cast where we talk to people from all walks of the publishing world. And tonight is the inaugural live read edition of our show that will take place every Tuesday of the month from this point going forward. And uh, we plan to have live reads genre specific. So uh, next month, we're, we haven't picked the genre yet, but we'll have a genre and we'll have authors from that genre come in and uh, read from their novels and we'll help them read them as well. So, but for tonight, Dave and I are going to be reading an excerpt from our own stories. And as I promised, we have a special guest with us today. Hillary Stokes is going to be filling in uh, for uh, Christy. We thought Christy might be here today, but she's not. And Hillary's gonna fill in for her and she is going to play the role of Hypernia. Now, how are you guys doing tonight? I'm good, thanks. <laughs> so uh, I know it's a, uh, this is a little bit different, in, uh, but I invite the viewers before we get going to, to feel free to ask us any questions or simply comment on what you're listening to tonight. We're just, uh, it's just a little fun live read where we're going to read uh, first an excerpt from uh, Dave's story, Hypernia Jones, and then we're going to read uh, from mine, Dragon Sect, and Dragon Sect released in, the, in November. So I uh, hope everyone enjoys it and sits back and has a bit of popcorn and enjoys the fun. So if you want to introduce your story, Dave. Okay, I will do. And please, uh, for people commenting, go easy on us because this is our first time. <laughs> You'll be just fine. So uh, this is a scene from uh, my uh, one of my recent novels, Hyperia Jones and the Olive Branch Caper, uh, which is very soft sci-fi comedy. Uh, and the scene features three of the characters from there. Um, one is called Doc, Dogface Denton, and he's a, a pro wrestler and the general manager of FIRE, the Federation of Interstellar Wrestling. Because in my world, it's. <laughs> in my world, it's called wrestling, not wrestling. Uh, and as part of his disguise, he wears an animated Dogface prosthetic. Um, the other character is Hyperia Jones. She's a septoid with tentacles on her head and she's one of the star wrestlers in Fire, but she also has a secret end of identity and lots of trust issues. And the last character is called String, who looks like a piece of string or a snake. And he's got an eye for the ladies and a taste for old classic movies. Awesome. So I'm just going to throw this out there. I see Anita Stewart's here. She's uh, one of our regular guests. And uh, Anita, if you uh, want to become a, a, a reader in our shows going forward, let me know. And uh, I think you mentioned before that you would, but uh, just PM me later on and uh, we'll get you involved very shortly. So, Hi, Anita. so just before we get started, I need to uh, get in the costume here. What's coming? <laughs> I don't think I want to see. <laughs> uh huh. Oh, really I, sweet, you, Richard. I couldn't really find a, a, a shirt that was like this to make me still look like a real wrestler, but I, I just can't really fill it out. So, and look at that! I've got some fan mail already. Look at that! Oh man. <laughs> I guess it depends on how you say that. <laughs> mm. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> but there is also that, so <laughs> okay, Dave, when you are wherever you and the Hypernia there are ready to take it away, uh, we're good to go. Okay. Did you have any more in the intro? No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Oh sorry, I did, yes. Uh, the scene is Denton sharing a story from his past hoping to get Hyperia to open up with some of her secrets. Okay. Denton swallowed hard, and so did the prosthetic dog head. Sorry, Dent, I said. Could you shut that down? It's a little spooky. Denton switched the prosthetic off and put it under the desk where I wouldn't see it. So the Combine called out for all but the youngest of the Siliconades to be called to ensure there were enough supplies for the mineral houses. You didn't. I argued with the herd manager for my section, said if we preserved the herds, we'd come back stronger, but he wouldn't listen. 
I couldn't speak and didn't even try. The look on Denton's face told me all I needed to know. We came to blows and he pulled a gun on me. Before I could react, Denton threw himself at the manager and mauled him. But before he died, the bastard got a shot off. Went straight through Denton's heart pump. Shit, I'm so sorry, Dent. I held him in my arms as his lifeblood pumped out. Even as he died, he didn't whimper. Just seemed happy I was with him. And after that, I had to leave Kurt. Some of the guys said I ordered Denton to attack. It wasn't true, but the rumor was enough to kill my chance of getting taken on at any of the other farms. So you left, formed fire, and became Dogface Denton? Oh, uh, not exactly, and not that easily, but anyway, that's not the point. Denton lifted his head and stared at me. What's your story, Hype? And why is it so important for you to get sparked, get to spark? My stomach twinged and I couldn't hold his gaze. I don't know what you... Stop! Denton sounded almost as doggy as his alter ego. I didn't tell you that story to gain sympathy. I hoped you'd realize you can trust me. Sometimes that's all you can do. Hype, you gotta have someone you can open up to. The idea of not living a lie all the time was appealing, and perhaps I could use a friend. While my double, or was that triple, life took up most of my time, it would be good to have an opportunity to relax with someone and not have to pretend to be something I wasn't, or not as much. But if I told Denton the truth, he'd become an accomplice, at least in the eyes of the law. I wasn't sure I or he was ready for that. For all his grouchiness at times, Denton was a nice guy and I didn't want to hurt him. But on the other hand, I'd lied to him over Guplides and now Sparth. I wasn't that close to the others, but Denton didn't deserve to have someone he considered a friend lying to him. Maybe he was right and I did need to trust someone. It felt like I'd been silent for an hour while all these crazy thoughts leaped through my head, but it could only have been a few minutes. Have you ever heard of Tequani? It felt surreal, as though it wasn't me talking. Tech what? He shook his head. Uh, sorry, no, what's that? No surprise. Tequani doesn't get a lot of publicity, unless you follow the crime news. Did I miss something? You're losing me, Hype. Okay, I took a deep breath. There's a professional thief for hire who operates around the realms. Every high profile burglary or theft is attributed to Tequani, whether it was them or not. Hey, I think I might have heard something about it. That psychic invalidation engine thing a couple of years ago. Yes, that was Tequani. And what? Denton frowned. You're running from this guy? Not exactly. I hesitated, knowing I was about to drop myself deeper in the slit. I am that guy. Denton blinked five times. His stone-coloured, mohai chair creaked as he rocked slightly. Then he stood and walked to a filing cabinet. He reached in and pulled out a bottle of Toquiedo tequila, one of the most potent alcoholic drinks available in the realms. He waved it at me and I shook my head. Then he grabbed a glass, pulled about three centimetres of the straw-coloured liquid, swallowed it in a single gulp and sat back down. Did I hear you correctly? You're telling me you're some kind of interstellar thief? I sniffed loudly. No, I'm telling you I'm the best interstellar thief there is. Oh, pardon me, I'm sure. I didn't think rank would be important in such a business. Well, now you know better. I already regretted telling him. And that's why we have to go to Sparth? Not because there's a ready audience, not because we can get a cheap venue, not because it's the best for the company, but because you want to go there to steal something? I know it looks bad, but the opportunity is a good one. You saw the details and thought so too. My pulse was thumping in my temples. Don't put this all on me and say there's nothing in it for fire. Denton held up his hands. Okay, what's next? You're gonna kill me if I talk? 
I'm a thief, not a killer. I squeezed the words through clenched teeth. Denton laughed humorlessly. <laughs> I'm so pleased to know there's a distinction. There's something else. This was the point where I should have kept my mouth firmly shut, but his dig about murder had me boiling mad. Let me guess. You're also a terrorist planning to assassinate the Uber Kaiser. I'm being forced to go to Sparse by Olive Branch. They need me to recover some stolen documents that could lead to war. Denton almost fell out of his chair. <laughs> Olive Branch? Now I know you're playing with me. That's a pile of Hollywood thrift. We should get to the dock to check you out. You're hallucinating. One of their agents, a lowlife called Bolt, caught me back on Iotromia pulling a job. He's been blackmailing me ever since. He was the one who arranged the Guplides gig. He arranged it? Sure, you don't think I know any generals, do you? I blundered on before I lost my nerve. He wanted me to do a job on Guplides, but it turned out it was a lie, a test to make sure I'd do what I was told. But the real mission is on Sparth. If I don't do it, I'll get locked away for a very long time. Or maybe they'll brainwork me instead. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, this is a lot to take in. Denton laughed again, but this time it was tinged with hysteria. I thought you were running for someone, like an irate husband or something, not this. I suddenly felt exhausted. Look, say the word and I'll leave. I can make my own way to Sparth. Perhaps once I've got this cleared up, I could come back. That ain't happening, sister. We're in this together all the way. String. Denton sounded as confused as I was. We heard a rustle and String's long body wriggled from under a couch against the far wall. Denton looked at me. Is this your idea? He said. Don't look at me. Lay off the babe. She ain't done nothing. String said. I came by to see if you wanted to watch Revenge of the Maltese Falcon and fell asleep. When I woke, the conversation was too juicy not to listen in on. You know what I mean? Have you ever heard the word privacy? Denton snapped. Sure, it's a word people throw around when they have something to hide. And you don't? I thought back to my conversation with him about why the Bonnells were picking on him again. Sure, everyone has secrets. He swished over to us. But I ain't the one banging on about privacy. Yammering about that ain't going to get us anywhere. So what should we be talking about? in your humble opinion. Denton said. Toots here ain't leaving. She's the best part of the show and you know it, no matter what the bonus claim. String. <laughs> I glanced in Hype's direction. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Dolphins here likes to go walk about at night sometimes. Who cares? As long as it ain't her in the company, that's her business. You saw me the other night, didn't you? I suspected that, but having it confirmed shook me more than I thought it would. Not all eyes are equal. String wriggled. Mine are small, but they see a lot. Maybe they see too much. Denton muttered. I wasn't about to cut hype loose, but what's that got to do with you? Simple. If she goes, I go. String coiled himself into a tight corkscrew shape. And if you lose two of your top performers, how long will it be until the next one and the next? Then before you know it, you ain't got nobody. Don't say that, String, I said. I'm not worth it. He's right, though. Denton stood as though he were going to throw us out, then changed his mind and dropped back into his chair. If either of you quit, this thing will fall apart quicker than a 10 count, and we need this gig to work. Or we're up Thrit Creek. He was right, but that didn't make me feel any better about it. My motive in getting to Sparth had nothing to do with helping the company. Now I was trapped by my guilt, unable to walk away, and yet unable to accept their help freely. So what's the job on Sparth, sweets? String tapped his tail several times on the floor. Who are we taking down? Denton jumped in his seat. 
What? Wait, I can't. I held up my hand. Don't worry, I'm not taking anyone down. I have to recover some information and identify the people who stole it. No violence involved. That ain't no fun. String hissed. I say we pack heaters from now on, just in case. Heaters? Denton lifted his eyebrows. Sure thing. Ain't no trouble a 45 and a slug of corn can't make go away. Denton looked over at me. Do you have any idea what this deranged worm is talking about? Less of the worm, buddy. He's talking about old-fashioned guns. I wondered if string could even hold, let alone shoot one. They fired metal pellets of different sizes. Oh yeah, I remember now. Denton rubbed his forehead slowly. No guns, no heaters, no shooting. Okay? That gets my vote, I agreed. I thought you wanted to promote this gig. String muttered. We could stage a bank robbery. Nothing like true crime to stir up the punters. If we're talking about actual angles, we'd better see what Christine has. Said Denton. She's the master when it comes to those things. I shuffled in my seat. I don't mind discussing storylines, but no one else can know about my Taquani operations. It would be bad for me and potentially deadly for them. For all I know, Bolt might think anyone who finds out about this is a legitimate target. The fewer people who know about this, the better. Denton said. I may look like a snake, but I ain't no rat. String coiled like a string. I breathed easier, but my thoughts were mixed up. Even though I was close to both of them, that was two more people in the universe who knew about my nighttime Two more people in the universe who knew about my nighttime activities than I'd ever expected there would be, and I couldn't stop the spasms of fear in my brain. I was exposed and vulnerable in a way I'd never been before. Awesome. Thank Good you. Good job. Good job, Hypernia. Thanks for joining us today. That was awesome. You're welcome. That was fun. <laughs> Okay, I will leave you now to Richard's exit. Uh, I should be listening. You're welcome. Hang around if you want. It's up to you. <laughs> yeah, I'll head out. Enjoy yeah, the rest okay. of the show. Okay. Right. We'll have to have you on again sometime. Okay. I, okay. I think we Bye. can do a Star Wars. I think we might do a Star Wars uh, edition someday, and uh, we'll have you back. Oh no. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. That was awesome. That was good. Yeah. It was strange. Oh. oh, awesome. You typed that in there. Good. That's awesome. You can actually type that in there. Excellent reading, Anita says. Let me just post that in there. That's awesome. I'm just going to pull up. Uh, let me know when you've got mine pulled up, and I'll, uh, I'll thanks, introduce. Thanks, Anita. What's that? Just said thanks to Anita. Let me know when you got me pulled up there. Anyway, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and introduce it. So, so the characters in this excerpt is from my uh, book two in High Cliff Guardians. It's called uh, Dragon Sect. Is the name of the book. And I'm in Canada, so you can't stay in these uh, wrestling shirts too often without getting cold. So. <laughs> too long, I guess. So it's a uh, there was a quite a poignant scene in uh, Keeper of the Jewel in which uh, this little wood sprite who uh, is such an insignificant creature did such a significant thing and he saved the lives of the High Wizard and uh, Scale, who was not an apprentice at that time. He was just a uh, part of the, the royal guard and uh, with the queen. But anyway, uh, they uh, they got together after uh, Keeper of the Jewel and in between that and Dragon Sect, uh, the goblin took on the elf as his high wizard apprentice and uh the goblin is very crotchety he's an old he's about 800 years old he doesn't take any guff from anything and he's uh, very cynical and the elf uh, scale who david will be playing uh was very unsure of himself at first uh, his father never thought he would amount to anything but uh, a royal guard he didn't think he had any magic in him scales always uh, wanted to be a magician or a wizard and so uh, he's uh, trying to get tutored by Elfwin, 
But Elfin, Elfin's attitude makes it very tough for Scale to come into his own. And Scale's still a little bit intimidated by him, but he's starting to come into his own. So the scene is the Goblin High Wizard, Elfin, and his Elven apprentice Scale have flown the dragon Zorain to a heavily forested mountainside to pay their respects to a fallen colleague who had given his life to save theirs last year. And it's from the chapter called From Unhappy Endings. And let me know when you're ready to go, Dave. I'm good. Okay. Dithrib. Dithrib wouldn't want us fussing over him like this, Elfin grumbled. Scale looked up from where he had dug the headstone into the ground in the space that the entrance stump had sat, rotting until early in the day. It had taken a lot of backbreaking work to remove the remains of the old tree fronting the entrance tunnel to the wood sprite's lair and fill in the gaping hole left behind to prevent anyone else from finding it. Scale's hands and face matched his dirt-smeared clothing. Glad he had chosen not to wear his usual black leather armor he had pilfered from, Cas from Castle Grimm last year. He looked up from where he mucked about in the dirt to espy the clean countenance of the High Wizard of South March. Don't worry, Master Alfred. There's no us fussing over the poor little guy. All right, just me. Bah! Alfin waved a claw tip hand in dismissal. The old knothead wouldn't have be any wiser if we never bothered. Scale rolled his eyes, ignoring the cantankerous old goblin, and patted at the dirt surrounding a magically inscribed lava stone grave marker, one that had been designed meticulously by Elfin himself. The High Wizard had spent weeks crafting it, destroying several earlier renditions before this one, stating that they weren't good enough. Dithrib had meant more to Elfin than the grumpy old wizard let on. Wiping filthy hands on the thighs of his breeks, Scale sat back against the wall of rock shooting up from the rear of the ledge he and Elfin attended and grabbed the water skin from the ground beside the goblin. He frowned at how much Elfin had consumed already, but the high wizard didn't appear bothered by the scrutiny. Scale sighed. Some things never changed. He had trained under high wizard Elfin ever since he had saved the goblin from certain death at the hands of a fair Merrill. At first, he had believed that Elfin tutored him out of a sense of obligation for Scale's role in a fair Merrill's death. But as the winter months had passed into spring, Elfin still insisted on training him between Elfin's other duties and the attention the High Wizard spent on Princess Odling, all undertaken with the same crotchety enthusiasm the persnickety goblin was renowned for. For the first time in his life, Scale was able to put aside the self-doubt instilled by his father with regard to his gift, something the hard-nosed captain of the Queen's Guard had tried to break him of before his heroic death in the passage of Dolore. According to Elfin, if Captain Geraint hadn't sacrificed himself to save Princess Odling, the future of South Mar March would have been bleak indeed. As it was, the High Wizard had made it obvious that he wasn't overly optimistic about the realm's future, asserting on more than one occasion during their training sessions that if South March was to survive the coming decades, the mystical princess was the only one who stood between them and imminent death at the hands of the soulless one. Elfin snatched at the unattended water skin from Scale's hand and drank deeply, his shrewd gaze taking in Scale's appearance. You'll be lucky if Zorane will fly you looking like that. Yeah? Well, it would be nice if I had help. Hell, how do you expect to learn anything if I do all the work? All the work? You've done nothing since we gave you except drink our water. Someone has to be in charge. Scale bit his tongue and looked out over the forest. New spring growth tipped the branches, and green shoots fought their way clear of last year's detritus to welcome the new season. If not for the many ridges lining the foothills of Thalen's nest, Scale believed he would be able to see the dark mass of Castle Grimm through the leafless trees, a sight he was happy not to witness. A large branch snapped somewhere in the quiet woodland. He smiled. His white dragon Zorian was somewhere close by, rooting through the undergrowth flushing out unsuspecting animals to satisfy his voracious appetite. Despite the chill of the breeze, a warm sensation flushed him. As recently as last summer, he would never have dreamt that not only would he be the recipient of private lessons from the highest wizard in the land, but that he would become a dragon rider as well, one of the select few who soared across the sky on the shoulders of a wondrous beast, something he did now on a regular basis without thinking about it. He glanced at the beautiful headstone, a fitting tribute to such a magical creature, marveling at the greenish glint Elfin had imbued along the edges of the intricately cut stone, and thought of the events 
happening back at Highcliffe. With the work done here, they might be able to witness the hatching. He picked up the water skin, realizing Alphen had finished it, and dropped it again. Alphen's dare, Alphen's look dared him to complain. The wizard was such a rascal. Biting back how he felt about the empty water skin, he forced himself to say casually. Zerone said the dragonlings will hatch today. He mentioned something about a dragon dance, whatever that is. I'm not deaf. I heard him. He got him nice to watch. You don't need to see it. You already got a dragon. But I've never been to a hatching. Of course you haven't, you big loop. You've never been to Highglyph before I brought you here. It would be a great experience. <laughs> I've seen enough of them for both of us. Scale frowned at the selfish response. He looked away, afraid of saying something he might regret. Although he appreciated Elfin's lessons, his magic had come a long way from the day he had tried to unlock the magical binding restraining Elfin and Craig's forge. He wasn't sure he could continue to refrain from lashing out at the cold goblin snarly attitude. Be too late now, anyway. Elfin broke the uncomfortable silence, his tone bearing the slightest hint of reconciliation. Skill didn't trust himself to speak until he inhaled and exhaled deeply three times. An exercise Elfin had taught him to control his excitement and anxiety should he ever have to cast a spell under pressure. Not happy with his mentor, he said with hopeful promise. It's been half a year since you started training me. How am I doing? All right, for someone so old. Old? To become a master magician, you started late in life. So, yes, old. I just turned 56 less than a month ago. I'm barely out of my elf in years. 56 years late, then. I'm surprised at how well you are doing. But don't get too excited. Your best learning years are wasted chasing menial pursuits. Scale glowered. Just once it would be nice if the high wizard threw him the odd compliment or word of encouragement. It wasn't his fault he hadn't been signaled out for arcane training earlier. His father had scoffed at the notion. Holding the wizard's gaze, Scale wondered how he kept from biting his tongue off, putting up with Elfin. <laughs> Did you bite your tongue off? <laughs> this is your yeah. cue. You're at, and how old were you when you were started? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just thought you brought, bit your tongue off so you couldn't talk anymore. <laughs> and how old were you when you started your training? Elfin opened his mouth to speak, but stopped, his eyes widening. A quick grin flashed across his face, but disappeared when he said, That's different. Of course, it's different. Skill rolled his eyes. Why wouldn't it be? He kept his thoughts to himself, but decided it might be fun to exploit Elfin's slip. Ah, uh, so you weren't young either. Elfin's eyes narrowed. His rough skinned throat contracted in a swallow as he looked away. <laughs> I'm right. Scale persisted, but thought better of his short lived exuberance as Elfin's evil glare threatened to consume him. I'm a goblin. We don't have the benefit of tolerance in most societies. Not even in the civilized realm of South March am I accepted for who I am, with the exception of a few elves. Not for Galvig's intervention, I would have been killed along with the rest of my clan centuries ago. Galvig. Galvig. Skell had heard that name before. Besides knowing it as the name of the mountain village that supplied the Wizards Guild in Norfolk Den, recognition dawned on him. You mean Grimlock? No, you witless northerner. I mean Gulvig. But what is it? Wasn't he? Yes. To the uncouth rabble, he was known as the warlock of Grimwatch Tower. Thus here in the nickname Grimlock. He took me and the dragon witch under his wing and sheltered us until Risa found a way to deal with Erdania. Scale nodded, recalling the legends. The sorceress is done yet? Elfin's eyes narrowed further, his voice dropping to a dangerous growl. Aye, you imbecile. Who else do you know 
is called Urdania. Skell almost laughed at that. Elfin did have a point. Knowing what little he did of the High Wizard, he wondered. Given the fact that you are but a goblin who isn't liked by the Elven masses, have you ever been interested to train anyone before? I'm guessing the Queen knows of all arrangements. Elfin cast him a withering glare. When Scale flinched, the wizard looked away, a profound sadness in his beady red eyes. Scale sighed. He had upset the High Wizard. Again. Look, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that the way it sounded. A long silence settled between them. The wooded slopes of Phelan's Nest darkened as the sun dropped below the peaks of the Madre Arch. A damp cold settled across the forest floor. Branches snapped, the noise growing in volume. Zorian had returned to take them home. I have trained two others. Skill barely heard Elfin's soft words. He swallowed and waited for him to continue. Once, long ago, I trained a talented young wizard in the hopes that someday his prowess would rival that of the Dragon Witch. From his humble beginnings as a scout in Nix's army, he became a formidable practitioner. It was my belief that if Islan Ors combined his magic with Rises, they would be strong enough to crush Urdania and end her evil reign. I had hoped to prevent the needless hardship and death that ensued as a result of Urdania's rise to power. Alas, Islam was betrayed by someone he had taken into his confidence and was sacrificed in one of the sorcerer's demonic rituals. Skill fought hard on the name. I who knows? Was he the one on the phone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's got a lot of magic. I, Peckland's grandfather. Skill nodded, goosebumps flushing his skin. The other was Queen Kay's only son. Elfin lowered his chin to his chest, dejected. I failed them both. A cold wind whistled through the dense branches overhead, sw swirling the clouds eastward. I thought that was coming from over here. The iron gray sky foretold the nasty weather sweeping in from the Nyad Ocean. Scale wiped the worst of the twigs and dried dirt from his clothing and placed a thumb and finger to his lips, emitting a shrill whistle to summon Zorane. Zorane's answering screech echoed off the hills. <coughs> Scale held out a hand. We'd best get back to Highcliffe before we get caught in the storm. Elfin didn't acknowledge him at first, but as the telltale sounds of Zorian crashing through the undergrowth grew in volume, he allowed himself to be helped up. Standing side by side, looking out over the forest floor at the white dragon's approach, Scale put a comforting hand on Elfin's shoulder. For one happy endings, new beginnings are forged, Master Elwin. Show me the way and I'll make you proud. <laughs> And that is it. That is it. CJ liked your wind. That was funny. I thought the wind was actually coming from over. <laughs> I got a window over there. And what the heck? <laughs> and Christy, welcome, Christy. Nice to see you. Or nice to hear from you. Yeah, I my phone rang, so I don't know if that's uh, supposed to be uh a magical sound that was in the background, or I guess we'll have to do sound effects next time we do one of these. That was the spell going off, wasn't it? I think it was, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Anita. Like I say, if there's any authors on here, Wanda, whoever, if you any of you guys want to uh, uh, participate in live reads in the future, just uh, let us know. We're going to be doing it uh, on the first Monday of every month. Uh, our cast of uh, guests for Looking for Legends is starting to thin out after... Uh, We've been doing it for a year and a month now, which is kind of cool that we've actually had enough guests to keep us going this long. So uh, we're starting to get a little uh, thin on guests. I think we're good until sometime in uh, in April. We're working on something to hopefully uh, fill in some time slots beyond that. So if anyone wants to participate on a live read, uh, just let Dave or I know and uh, we'll make it work. So, so I'm not sure what are your thoughts, Dave, on today's live read. Uh, your zone, so. I'm still in shock. <laughs> Why is that? I don't know. I just, well, uh, it's not me. <laughs> no, no, you did good though. 
it's, it's, it's fun. And the, the more you do it, the, the easier it gets. And like when I, I used to do them with Chrissy and I always try to make her laugh and she's reading and the, it's just almost like a Carol Burnett show where you try to make the reader laugh. And the, the nice thing, I knew you were doing something in the background there, but my face is kind of turned this way so that I, and I'm actually blind in this eye. So it really helped that I really couldn't see what you're doing. I knew you were doing something. Arr. <laughs> yeah, I should. I, I'd say I could be a pirate. It wouldn't bother me. <laughs> anyway, so uh, if anyone has any questions before we go, uh, we might cut this one a little bit short just because uh, we're not quite sure of the formats as far as uh, word length. I think that wasn't too bad. We're both about 2,000 words. So that worked out quite well. I think if we had three readers, we'd definitely, uh, we'd definitely fill the time in. So. <laughs> For all the wrong reasons, hey, Christy? <laughs> yeah. I think she's laughing at my my talking. Maybe she's laughing at my story. It was uh, that poorly poorly written. So, but uh, anyway, we appreciate it. And if anyone wants to uh, be a member of uh, our cast, uh, let us know, and we'll get you in there on one of these uh, Mondays. It'll be the first Monday of every month, and we're trying to going to do it uh, genre specific. So next month, we haven't picked a genre yet, but we will. <laughs> and. Uh, I'll talk to Dave over the next uh, week or so, and we'll pick a genre, and then I'll contact some authors. Maybe um, just kind of base it on whoever gets in touch. Yeah, I'd like mm -hmm. to line up a couple of different uh, authors in that genre if we can. So I guess uh, I'll, I'll just reach out. To, we'll, we'll come up with It'd be a interesting, theme. I think, to do kind of like some kind of a mystery one. You want to do a mystery one next time? Yeah, that'd be kind of fun. All right. There you go. We will have mystery authors on here next month. I will reach out and uh, get a hold of a couple of our mystery authors and we'll get them on here. So, CJ we get Agatha Christie? What's that? Do you think we could get Agatha Christie? Agatha Christie? I don't know if she would be available anymore. You can reach out to her. I, you know, it's funny because uh, when we, when Christy and I uh, first started this last year, uh, I reached out to uh, many. Uh, prolific authors. I reached out to Stephen King. I reached out to Brandon Sanderson. I reached out to J.K. Rowling and I reached out to R.A. Salvatore. And uh, J.K. Rowling, uh, her PR person got back to me pretty well right away saying, you know, this she's just too busy. And I get it. <laughs> she's not going to be messing about probably with uh, people like us, but uh, at least she had the decency to get back. The only other one that got back to me was, uh, oh, I reached out to Terry Brooks as well. And I was very disappointed because He's my idol. But uh, Ari Salvatore, who is very huge in the fantasy world, uh, he reached out and said, I'm sorry, I'm too busy this year. Maybe try next year. So I reached out at Christmas, and I messaged him. And within within a day, he messaged me back saying, uh, I'm busy with the Christmas rush. He said, I'm getting behind in my writing. Maybe uh, try me again this spring. So uh, at least he has the decency to at least get back to us. Or, you know, so, mm -hmm. so hopefully we can snag a, a big person like that down the road that would be kind of cool wonder um, you might think that your stuff is too heavy but i'm sure that with me and richard butchering it it wouldn't be <laughs> I, I, yeah we want to write some pretty uh serious stuff so i don't know if there's a lot of interplay in hers where you can have a i'm gonna i'll talk to caroline afterwards i know she's read wanda's stuff and see if there's if there's characters actually speaking back and forth. I don't mind doing something heavy, Wanda, and if uh, if we can make it a theme where uh, we have a bit more of a serious episode uh, to hopefully address uh, some social issue, then I don't mind doing that as well. But uh, sure, yeah, no, it doesn't always have to be fun and lighthearted. It can, you know, we've done that before. Christy and I had uh, someone in the summer who was uh, had an issue, and we actually did a special episode on Sunday night to speak on that. So that's uh, we're certainly not averse to doing that. Uh, you know, all we ask is that it's not too uh, too racy as far as uh, we don't want <laughs> a very uh, explicit yeah. sex scenes or you know too much vulgarity. I don't mind a little bit of vulgarity. It's you know it's part of life and people swear and you know got to get over it. But if it's uh, yeah, I'm not doing that. Every I'm other, doing other word, then it's over the line. Sense. I'm not going to start huffing and puffing on on live chat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That would be great, Anita. Yeah, no, that would be awesome. If you can hook them up, uh, let me know, and I will send you the link, and then you can send that link to all those people. That would be awesome. 
Yeah. Yeah, we're certainly we're not adverse to anyone coming on our show. Like I say, we uh, we would like to we welcome anyone. You, you know, you can have one book out. You could be J.K. Rowling. We'll certainly uh, take you on here. So it's just a lot of fun just to talk a little bit about what we do and speak to our own tribe. It's kind of fun on a Tuesday night. <laughs> Thanks, CJ. <laughs> <laughs> No cuffing and puffing. Well, that's only if we do the Star Wars thing with uh, Hillary again. <laughs> but we'll leave that alone. Mm, maybe. maybe so. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm going to wrap us up today, Dave, unless you have something else to add. No. No, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. So what is there anything new that you want to report on with the, in the, the Joe Bell or, or oh. the Two Feathers World? No, uh, pretty much the same thing. I'm just kind of like working my way through this editing and, and it's getting to the point where I feel like I'm banging my head against the brick wall, but it's progressing. So, yeah. You know, hopefully I should have this round finished by the end of this week. That's that's my hope. The round of editing. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, it was always... my uh, external editor for her to look at. It's amazing how uh, time-consuming editing can be. You, know, you think you oh, read a book so quickly, and then all of a sudden you go to edit, and it's just I, – I set aside a week, and then next thing it's two weeks, two and a half weeks, and go, oh, my God. Like, and it's so dry because you're reading your own thing over and over and over again, and yeah. it's it's not exciting anymore. You know, and yeah, I, mean, I can usually manage about two chapters a day. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it can I mean, be a tough it varies by the length, but – you know, sort of thing. Usually, it's kind of like around two two chapters a day, and then I'm kind of done. I can't do mm -hmm. any more. You know, no, your so eyes go blurry. Like, yeah. You know, I mean, you think about like your typical book. It's kind of like you know, maybe sort of like twenty, thirty chapters or so, maybe more. And it's like, I mean, you know, you took in like two weeks straight away. You know. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it certainly takes longer than you think it does. That's for sure. So anyway, uh. Next week's guest, uh, oh, I guess in the Swole Forge universe, I'm still working on uh, Wind Walker. I'm about 76,000 words in now. It's not going as quick as I thought it would. So I originally planned for an April release date. I don't think it's going to be released until probably June now. But uh, and that was, <laughs> that's one of those things that keeps getting pushed back as I go. But mm -hmm. uh, hopefully uh, the writing speed will pick up a little bit in the next little while, and away we go again. But uh, I'm just in the middle of editing that. And, I oh, I'm redesigning the covers for The Legend of the Lurker. So I have the new cover for Rika's Flight, but I won't be showing it to the world until, unless you watch my live reads on a Thursday night, you won't see the new cover until I release all three of them. And mm -hmm. then uh, I will have a release party, I guess, or something uh, probably sometime in the spring with all three books with the new covers. So that's kind of exciting, working with a, a cover designer in – I believe she's in Singapore or the Philippines. She's somewhere over there where it's there's 11 hour time difference. So when I talk to her in the morning, she's going to bed. And when she talks to me in the evening, uh, she's just waking up. So that's uh, uh, good news about the, uh, the potential uh, book show. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Uh, that is uh, that was so uplifting today. I haven't mm -hmm. done a book show since March 1st, 2020. And today, yeah. Dave and I, Dave's talking about the sci-fi fantasy uh street party in a little town called elmville in northern well i guess it's midwestern not midwestern middle of ontario it's up by wasega beach if anyone's familiar with uh, ontario it's probably about an hour north of toronto up on georgian bay and it the whole town has this little street festival and it's all about science fiction and fantasy and uh, dave and i were there it was 2019 i believe yeah, yeah 2019 I mean, we'd planned to attend in 2020 as well, and then uh, 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 yeah, they got shut down. And, uh, and then it was cancelled again last year, and but it looks like they're going to try and make it happen for 2022. So if that work goes on, uh, I'll certainly be there, and I'm sure you will be Richard, and, and that should be a lot of fun. So 2022, yeah. So it's happening this year. This year, yeah. Yeah, so that that's actually uh, promising that uh, things are looking like they might start uh, trying July to up again. Second, was it? What's that? It's July second. Yeah. Yeah, July second. Saturday, July second. So that should be good. It's a Canadian long weekend, so hopefully we get lots of people up there. That's a very busy place because there's a very famous beach up there. Mm. So hopefully it'll be very busy. 
And yeah, so that was very uh, nice to see that today. That's a, it's, it gives us a little bit of hope, a ray of hope that things are maybe slowly coming back to normal because I mm. certainly do miss doing sure. the book events. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so next, next week's guest, uh, Dave and I hope you enjoyed the inaugural library today. Uh, next week's Lurking for Legends, we'll be talking to creative nonfiction author Caroline Topperman. I don't know if we've had a strictly nonfiction person on Lurking for Legends yet, so that should be interesting. Uh, Caroline is a European Canadian writer, entrepreneur, dancer, and world traveler born in Sweden, raised in Canada with a recent stint of living in Poland. She holds a BFA in screenwriting. What's a BFA? Do you know, Dave? Uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts. Ah. That's, what, that's why I have you on the show here. <laughs> You're the brains and the looks. Absolutely. She has a BFA in screenwriting. Her book credits include Tell Me What You See, Visual Writing Prompts for the Wandering Writer. And I have to actually saw that on Monday. I'm, she's part of the same writing group I'm in in uh, Kitchener down here in Ontario. And I saw her book and she has these writing prompts in this book. And they're very interesting pictures from around the world. Uh, the prompt they did on yesterday, I guess it was, uh, was a piano sitting beside a river, just out in the middle of nowhere. There's a piano and, and a river. Someone hauled it all the way out there. It was a great big grand piano, and they just left it beside the river. And she's also a writer of uh, the book called Fit Wise, a straight talk about being fit and healthy. I could probably use that. And she has written articles for Huffington Post. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, maybe we won't even bother talking about Fit Wise. I'll be embarrassed. Was the beauty editor for British Mode magazine. Well, you might want to know about that. You might be in that one. And is the managing editor for Non-Binary Review. Her writing career also includes professional copywriting for a well-funded online startup and real estate development website. So Dave and I look forward to speaking with Caroline next week. So for Dave yeah. and myself, until next week, take good care. i got to grab the right mouse here to end the show. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks Bye -bye. very much, everyone. Good night.